It's the first of the year, and I know some of you are saying, I just want to be home, but I commend you for being here. It's a good way to start the year and, um, and get back into the habit. Are you ready to get back into the habit of the routine? Yeah, we've been on the routine for a few weeks. So let's go to the book of Genesis, and I want to go to Genesis chapter 50, and then uh, hold your hand in chapter 37, but I want to start in 50. And I want to talk with you uh, today about character character. Lord, as we begin now in the new year, uh, would you uh, create in us a clean heart, renew a right spirit within us, that uh, we are uh, people who not just live each day but make progress in each day as we head towards heaven and growing in this thing of character may I, our ambition be to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness may it knock off the impurities of our lives the things that don't look like christ and may you give to us the character that is truly his and we pray this in the name of Christ, our risen Savior. The church would say amen. amen. So it's a new year, and with that new year, there'll be some resolutions, and you're going to make some uh, resolutions that you'll, you'll chase, and others you'll just drop partway in and say that wasn't worth it. But I'm asking the question this morning, how will your life be different a year from today? To just go out to January 1 of 2018. How will, you, how will your life be different? How will you make the world a better place? Forget the world. How will you make your own life better? Because at the end of the day, get this, this is profound, this is deep. Uh, because you have to live with you. Think about that. Why not make yourself a better person because, not just for other people, but you. You. How will you make your life better because you have to live with you all the time? How will you um, treat people who look up to you a year from now? How will you treat people who don't look up to you who actually look down on you? How will you treat people a year from now who think something less of you? How will you deal with your own demons, your bent towards foolishness or hostility or selfishness? How would you like to have your life described a year from now as, my gosh, she is so honest, or my goodness, he is a man of integrity. What about being described as a person of honesty or integrity? What if a year from now, people described you as loving? Would that be okay? What, what if you lived for the long-haul legacy, not what society is so hell-bent on, I gotta have it now kind of strategy. What if in a word, we were people of character, even when no one's looking? It's been 25 years ago now, uh, uh, James Patterson and Peter Kim, 1991, wrote a best-selling book entitled, The Day America Told the Truth. Some of us have read it, we've forgotten it, and you've gone back to it. It's a, it's a great piece of work, but a great document for us to just mirror ourselves off of to see about society. The authors found a way to survey Americans and get the truth because they weren't going to be tracked. So people were actually honest. Isn't that interesting? They were actually honest because they knew they wouldn't be tracked. And what we found out was not just disturbing, it was downright scary. We found work and values were really coming up short. People lied, they stole from the company, they justified it. In situation ethics, people would do just about anything for money. We found when America told the truth, even criminal behavior was not out of the norm. There was nothing beyond the possibility of what Americans would do if they knew it couldn't be tracked. A decade later, it was Charles Colson who wrote in an article entitled The Post truth society, that there's a recent trend in line, and that recent trend is no accident. He, he then begins to just give little clips from the news, like the one of George O'Leary, who was the head coach of Notre Dame football for about 36 hours. He had been announced as the new coach of uh, the Notre Dame University's football team, 
And then they found out his resume wasn't exactly what they thought it was. He said he had a master's degree and he really didn't. He said he had uh, a certain kind of record. He played positions and he did certain things. He hadn't actually done them. And to their embarrassment, they said, we think it'd be a good idea if you'd resign. The problem with this is, is that other schools had employed him. They had to have known this. He was 55 years old, he's not a kid. So this was documentable. This is not the day America told the truth because they can't get caught. This is, I'm writing this down and signing my name to it. See if you'll call my bluff. No one checks references. That's where we're headed. And George O'Leary's not the exception. Colson would go on to give Pulitzer Prize authors, award-winning authors who plagiarized, who invented stories for the, for the sake of building a case for their books. It's downright nervy. These people posted things, not in an anonymous form, but with their signature, with their, in their own resumes. It could be verified. They lied. So what's up with that? And why is that okay now? Colson would go on to say that uh, some scholars believe the problem actually arose through the adoption of a utilitarian kind of ethic, one that's being eroded from traditional Christian ethic of the West in the middle of the, in the late 19th century. The ethic says that the end justifies the mean. You've, you've probably heard that before, right? And what Colson is saying is that's where we're headed, is you just do what you need to do to get done what you need to get done. So what I want to talk with you today and the, the coming weeks is character because ultimately you and I answer to a holy God who rates us on a holy factor. That does not swing with situations or with opportunities. So character being our topic, what if a year from now you were more of a person of character? What if I were even more honest? What if I had more civility less hostility? What if I had more wisdom and less foolishness? One guy was like that in the Old Testament. We're in Genesis. This guy's name is Joseph. And Joseph is the kind of guy that just almost nothing can be found wrong about the guy. Just He's a great example for us to learn from. Here's a guy who had been through the ringer, really. He'd been through some scary, very volatile encounters, deeply hurt all of his life, all of his life. And yet, when it comes down to it, the bottom line, chapter 50, verse 20, he says to his brothers, you intended to harm me. You tried to kill me. God intended this for good, verse 20. To accomplish what is now being done to save many people. He's saying, you you intended to do bad. God's using this for good. Now, Before we get too far into the story of Joseph, there are 11 other brothers. They're standing before the prime minister, really, of Egypt, second in command. That ruler is their brother, Joseph. They don't know it because they haven't seen him for years because they sold him. They have not, they just viewed, they just assumed he'd be dead by now. And Joseph, when he sees it's the brothers, he could have had them killed and no one would have batted an eye but he takes what is a very horrible set of circumstances and he makes it redeemable. He sees life from God's perspective. And that would be really the key for us. It would be to ask, what is God up to in the circumstances of my life? Maybe God is out for my good. It's really an issue of trusting a good God and pursuing him even when you don't see everything that he sees. Now, having said all that, let's go back to chapter 37 now, at the beginning of the story, Joseph. I like to think that Joseph grew up in a quiet little town, you know, and and his life was a beautiful life. That was not how it started for him. Genesis chapter 37, verse three reads, now Israel, his name is Israel, his name is also called Jacob. It, it, it flip-flops, it depends on referring to the office or the nation or the, the father of the nation. His name's Jacob and he'll be sometimes called Israel. So if, you, if your translation says Israel, that's okay. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> is it not for you? Yeah. I am dad's favorite. Yeah, that's what I tell my brothers too. They chased me with a stick too. You know, I, they, would, they would do the same with you. 
because he had been born to him in his old age. So he made an an ornate robe for him. That's where we get the idea of uh, Joseph in the coat of many colors. It may have been actually a white coat that just shimmered with the rainbow of colors. We're not exactly sure. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, and they could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph grows up in a very dysfunctional home. His father's involved in a family feud. That's chapters 36, 35, 34. You can go back and read that. His brothers hate him. His dad plays favorites, gives him a robe that signifies not just richness, but favor and prestige. It goes on to say in this chapter, Joseph has dreams about his brothers. And and he says to his brothers, hey, I had this dream. And they say, oh, yeah, whatever. He goes, no, I had this dream. Your stuff bows down to my stuff. They went, we hate you. We absolutely hate you. He goes, yeah, you can't believe it. Your crop will bow down to my crop. It's really pretty cool. And then they go, you you don't understand. We absolutely hate you. Jacob, the dad, sends Joseph to go check in on his brothers one day. This cannot be a good situation. You never send the youngest kid to check in on the older kids. Either he has to lie. How are they doing? Oh, they're doing fine. They're cleaning their rooms just like you said. They either have to lie or they rat out the brother right? It, it, doesn't gonna, it isn't going to end well. So Joseph's coming. The brothers see him from a distance, chapter 37, verse 17. So Joseph went after his, his brothers and found him near Dothan. But when they saw him in the distance, before he reached them, get, get these words, they plotted to kill him, to kill him. This is really dislike, is it not? Oftentimes people think, I just wish things were like they were in the olden days, okay? Let me tell you, Genesis is about as old as the olden days get. There's, n- there's nothing before Genesis, and the brothers are ready to kill their younger brother. This is shocking to you and me, but it's not shocking to them. It's well within the realm of possibility. And do you know why? Because Jacob, their dad, was a deceiver, grew up in a dysfunctional home. He was a deceiver by his nature. He was in conflict with other countries and other people. The brothers had cut each other off. They had a sister who had been sexually violated. When the brothers found out about it, they went in and killed a whole village. These guys were not afraid to kill. They kind of normalized it, and that's the problem. Dad, who had long been an instigator in deception, while we're, we're shocked by this, they have normalized it. It's not a big deal. How do you get to the point where you can kill your brother? And here's the answer. Little steps. A little bit of bitterness, a little bit of anger, a little bit of strife. And you know what? That all builds up over time. If you don't let, get, get rid of that, there are New Testament principles that say don't go to bed while you're doing, while that's going on. In other words, keep short accounts. Do you know why? Because if you don't, it will pile on. And when it piles on, killing will be the natural end to this. It happens in very small steps. So right from the start, we need to be hard on our own sin. Otherwise, we'll become comfortable with it. This is what's so amazing to me. When, people, when I find people who are way off of the godly model, and I find, out how, how did you get there? And they'll tell me the steps that got them. They're not huge steps, just small steps. So be hard on ourselves with little bits of sin. Joseph, it, when they get him, they decide, well, instead of killing him, let's make money on him. So they sell him to a caravan coming through. That caravan will sell him again, chapter 39. Turn the page there, chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. So they leave really what's called Israel, the Holy Land area, and they go down to North Africa, to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him uh, from the Ishmaelites, that's the group that initially bought him, and who had taken him there. And so he's being sold again. In other words, what's happening is he's being handed off like property. And if this is happening, you're never going to find him. You're never going to find him. He is held against his wishes, but he, he makes the most of the opportunity. He works hard and he builds trust within the system, but he, he doesn't belong there. The whole time he's there, you could just imagine, he's with the Ishmaelites. He's saying, really, I don't belong here, people. They say, shut up and get back. And he gets to Egypt, and Potiphar picks him up and buys him to work in in the palace. 
And, and he walks up to Potiphar and says, I, I don't belong here. I, yeah, right, you're just like all the other criminals. You don't, yeah, right, whatever. I don't belong here. This is a mistaken identity. Yes, of course, get back in line, do the work. So he makes the most of what he has, but the problem comes is he's so trustworthy that he advances in the system. And because of that, he becomes part of the household work. And Potiphar's wife actually takes a liking to him. And perhaps Potiphar, who is a high commanding officer under the Pharaoh, is too busy or he doesn't attend to the needs of his wife. But for whatever reason, the woman has an eye for Joseph. Verse six, Joseph is well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted to my care. He's saying, I can't do this. It'd be a violation to my boss. It just, it's just wrong. And she attempts to seduce him, but Joseph's character shines through. By the way, you could say, well, hey, no one's going to know. No one's going to, we're alone in the house. What would it matter? And character is what's at stake, whether anybody knows or not. You see, character is who you are when no one's looking. He's more concerned with the well-being of his boss, of trusting God in the midst of this. So she feels shunned, like, what's wrong with me that he doesn't want me? So she presses charges. Verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison the place where the king's prisoners are confined. This is telling. Stop here just for a moment. Potiphar could have had Joseph killed immediately because immorality in the palace, that's executable. He could just dispose of him, but he doesn't. He puts him in jail. I think Potiphar knew the character of his own wife. It's conjecture. But I think there's some argument to say I think this guy's a good guy. I hate to just snuff his life out. And he offers so much. Let's put him in jail and see what happens. So that's what happens. You know what I find too is that when you get close to someone who exaggerates and exaggerates and exaggerates, like perhaps the wife did, then you know I can't trust anything they say. And that trustworthiness is lost. It has to be regained. You know what? And there's a difference between forgiveness and trust. You could forgive the person, but that trust has to be earned. Let's skip down to chapter 40. Sometime later, he's still in jail. A cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Verse 2, Pharaoh was angry with the two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody of the house of the captain of the garden in the same prison where Joseph was confined. Stop there. So the cupbearer and the baker getting thrown in the same jail. This is a royalty jail. And you could be tossed in jail for any number of reasons, but if it's those two, the cupbearer is the guy who tests the, the wine to make sure it's not poison. The baker is, is making food. Obviously, if they don't like the king, they're going to poison him. And they think that they... They think that they have cause for that, so they throw them in jail. Well, these guys have dreams, and Joseph tells them about the dreams. Now, he's done that with the brothers, and that didn't go well. Now he's doing it with the cupbearer and the baker. And Joseph tells them the meaning of the dreams. One guy, he says, one guy you're going to get out, the other guy you're going to die. Sure enough, that's what happens. The, the cupbearer is released, and the baker is executed. And when the cupbearer is released, Joseph tells him, don't forget me. Remember me in jail, and I don't belong here. Mention me before the Pharaoh, and I'm telling you, uh, he'll like me. He'll, he'll want me out. And the cupbearer says, sure, I'll, I'll remember you. And when you read the end of chapter 40, the very last verse of 40 says, and the cupbearer forgot about him. He just stopped for a moment. Joseph has been treated horribly. He's got a bad childhood He's been sold more than once. It's degrading. He's been made a slave. He's, now he's falsely accused of sexual misconduct. And, and then he helps some guys in jail, and then those guys don't even think to come back and thank him and try to get him out. And even in the midst of all that trouble, we don't have any indication that God is judging him for sin. There doesn't seem to be any retaliation for sin or payment for sin. 
And yet, what I see in Joseph is not a guy who shuts down. Instead, he's willingly doing what God has called him to do because God uses willing vessels. And even though he's forgotten, he still is a faithful servant inside the jail. He actually serves with inside the jail system. Chapter 41. And when two full years had passed, you and I would be going stark, raving crazy. Where in the world is the cupbearer? Wouldn't you? I mean, I'd be looking for his head, wouldn't you? In verse 8, in the morning, his mind was troubled. Pharaoh had a dream, and his mind's troubled. He sent for the magicians and the wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Verse 9, then the cupbearer goes, oh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. I remember this guy in jail. I remember this now. There's a guy who does this. He tells, he can interpret dreams. What's his name? Joe, Joe something. Yeah, he's, he's in for, he, worked, he used to work with Potiphar. So they go down to the jail. They call up all the Joes. Who worked for Potiphar? They, they line that guy up, and sure enough, they get Joseph. They wash him up, put him a fresh set of clothes on him, and he goes before Pharaoh. Verse 28. It is just as I said to the Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Stop there. He, he says, I, I don't interpret these dreams on my own, people. This is only because God's given me this gift. And he's saying, I, this is exactly Pharaoh. I'm going to tell you the interpretation. Seven years, you're going to have abundance, verse 29. And, and then seven years of famine will follow, verse 30. And then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the, fa- and the famine's going to ravage the land. So the key to this, Pharaoh, is, is surviving is you've got to stockpile. You've got to figure a way to, to be setting some back every year so you're way ahead of the curve on this. Because if you don't, we're all going to die. Pharaoh says, I like your idea. And I like the interpretation. It makes total sense. So since I like what you're saying, I- I'm just going to put you in charge of it. Verse 41, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. Don't miss out on this. He puts the signet ring on his finger. He has given him power. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. Stop there. He dressed him in clothes of fine linen. You know, if this were me and... I got a brand new robe again, I think I would run, wouldn't you? I'm just thinking, there's an associational thing here. This didn't work out well before. I can't imagine it working out well now. And he put a robe on him, fine linen, gold chain, and he had him riding a chariot. Get this, he was in prison, and the next day he's in a chariot. He's second in command, get this. Joseph wakes up in jail in a filth and disease and disgust. He's with other criminals. Get this. And he's been there for years now. For years. And he's worked his way through the system. He's actually a leader inside the jail system. That's what he wakes up in. And that night he goes to bed in the palace with brand new clothes, a brand new robe, a shiny ring, gold around him, and a chariot parked out front. What had changed about Joseph? And the answer is nothing. He had always been a man of character. He had always been a man of character. What had changed was the situation. You see, you cannot cannot control all the situations. What you can control are the decisions of your own heart. To always do the right thing, always to walk humbly, always to speak the truth, Always to be a person of civility. Always, always to look towards the side of holiness. That was Joseph. He had not changed in the day. It was the, it was the room. It was the situation. And Joseph didn't shut down when he was falsely accused. He didn't choose the, get this, he could have, when he was in prison, chosen the path of bitterness and angst. But instead, he trusts God in the midst of all of this. And sure enough, 
There were seven great years of incredible harvest. And he said, nope, can't eat all that. Got to stick some of this back. Got to save some of it. We're going to eat some of that next year because next year we're going to save two-sevenths. And he started building buildings and, and stockpiling grain. And sure enough, at the end of seven years, the famine set in. And then they had seven bad years. And during the seven bad years, they, they lived off of what they had stockpiled. In fact, Egypt was one of the countries, uh, the neighboring countries came to because they had food. Get this. If, if you'll walk with God and trust him and plan and manage well, use the brain God has given to you, people will come towards you. They went towards Egypt to get supplies. Chapter 42 now. There's a family north of them. It's Jacob, Israel, his family. They're out of food. And they're saying, you know, I've heard there's food in Egypt. Let's go there. Chapter 42, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he sent his sons. Why do you keep looking at each other, guys? Don't stand around looking at each other. I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us that we may live and not die. I love that. Make it obvious. We will live, not die. And so, long story short, they go to Egypt and when they get there, they see Joseph, but they don't know it's him. He's really changed. And they ask for grain. There's a number of things. That are, we'll talk about this in the weeks ahead of time, Lord willing. But he has several encounters with them, sends them back and forth. And finally, he can take it no longer. Chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could, could no longer control himself before all of his attendants. And he carried out, everyone leave my presence. He, he gets all the guard, all the staff, everyone out. All he has are the brothers in the room. And he shuts the door. There's no one with Joseph. And then he makes himself known to his brothers. He tells them, I'm Joseph. And he wept, verse 2, so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household even heard about it. So there's just wailing going on. He can't believe it. He's weeping so loudly. And Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph, verse 3. Is my father still living? Okay, this is not why Dave was there. Because I would have said, I am David, and you are going to die slowly. That's what I would have done. Yours is going to be. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been, if you're like us. We watch the evening news, and then Wanda and I just give running commentary, you know. And she'll say, you know, someone did this, this guy did something to this lady. And then my wife will go, and he should die very painfully, very slowly. We'll start with the fingernails, we'll work our way up, then I'm going to heal him. And then I'm, gonna, and I'm going, you are a Marine's daughter, are you not? You, you could kill me with the can opener. I, I, I want to be kind to you, honey, you know. But I, the, Joseph, what are his first words? I am Joseph. His very next words, how's dad? Do you get this? Now, all the commentaries, you know what they talk about? They talk about his revealing who he is. They talk about the brother's fear, and they should be scared. And the fact that they're so scared, they're stunned. They're stunned. We're done. We're, we're dead. We're not going to get out of here. And they tried to defend the brother. There's quite a bit of drama in all this because they tried to defend the little brother. They didn't want this to happen again. And, and they're living out their own fear. This is what sin does. It makes you paranoid. It makes you fearful. It makes you angry because you regret your other decisions. So then you're mad all the time. And that, honestly, is, is one of the responses when you know you've made a mad, mad decision. You ever bought a car that got a stupid car? You ever done this? Stupid sofa. I didn't need it. And you're mad at the stupid sofa. The sofa, the sofa isn't, isn't that stupid which only leaves another, per I don't know, not many alternatives around. But, but you get mad at the very thing you, know, you made the bad decision about. That's where these brothers are. So they're, they're angry and scared, maybe even paranoid, and they're sure, oh, we're dead. But that's not Joseph's response. What's his response? Is dad still living? Can I hug my father? Okay, back to the text. I am Joseph, verse 3. Is my father still living? Brothers, brothers were not able to answer him. Why? Because they are terrified in his presence. They are terrified. And that, that's where the scholars park, is right there. 
but, and, and that's okay to do that. I find it interesting. He does not shame them. He doesn't bite back. He doesn't take revenge. It's not even hinted. What is, what is stated is, I care about my father. Please tell me he's okay. What kind of heart must it take to go decades, not see your dad, and then know that your dad's a deceiver, your brothers have sold you, and yet you still care for them? That's the kind of character we need, folks. And that's what brings us to chapter 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me. God intended it for good. In other words, we can trust God. Let me bring this to January 1, 2017. We can trust God. Regardless of circumstances, we can trust God. Regardless of what others do, we can trust God. Regardless of what others say, how they work the numbers, how they work the wording, how they write their resumes, what they say they do or don't do. I can't control all that, but I can control, I can't change them, I can only change me. You can't change them, you can only change you. God was working, get this, God was working even when no one could see it. He took these kind of circumstances, not only to save a young boy who got sold, but to save a family, which then would become, his brothers would become the cluster of tribes. I hope you get this. Which would grow into a nation. So this one guy grows to a family of 12, which become 12 tribes, which now becomes a large family, which becomes a nation, which 400 years later becomes two million people. And that nation would be the birth and the line to the Savior. I hope you don't miss this. And all of that ugliness, people meant for bad, and all of it God uses for good. You see, what I'm afraid of is that we've sold ourselves to the lie of Christian entitlement, which is that God owes us something. Since I follow Jesus, this is how it reads. I try hard. He owes me a better life. He owes it to me. I deserve it. No, we don't deserve it. But the biblical perspective on life is that since I trust God and since I know he's out for my good, I can follow. Why? Because he might be up to something better. Not just the circumstance, but he might be up to something better. I don't have to see. I don't have to know. I don't, you know what? If I see, then I'll want to know, and then I'll want to approve. This is the way you know, we pray. Oh, God, I, like, I want to know your will for my life. God's going, I'm not going to tell you your will, the will for your life. Why? Because then you'll want to approve it. It's not up for approval. It's God's will, not your will. Trusting that God is at work in my life is building character in my life. So here's where I want to go in the next weeks. And we're, I've just given you a flyover of, of Joseph. We're going to take it now chapter by chapter in the weeks ahead. We're going to talk about humility in a culture that is swimming in pride. So we're going to encourage humility in a culture that's all about me. It's all about me. I am scared with the culture today. And if you are not, it, you're, you may not be aware. Just the selfie kind of culture we live in is, is uh, scary. And then it's integrity. Integrity in light of the deceitfulness. You being the real deal in a world that values image over everything. Image is where it is, not the reality. Character is loyalty in a society that only values unfaithfulness. So loyalty, staying power in a world where commitments are broken. We are people of character. We will keep our commitments. Wisdom in a, in a place where foolishness seems to be the norm. When injustice is the norm, it's easy to retaliate with foolishness. And when you retaliate with foolishness, you're playing right into the enemy's hand. So choose wisdom. Civility. 
Uh, I, actually, this whole series started about eight months ago. I wanted to do a series over the summer called Whatever Happened to Civility. And we talked about doing it in the fall, and it wasn't good timing, and we couldn't get it in. But I, I wanted to do a thing called the Civility Project, actually, because our culture is, by and large, we're about an inch away from hostility on a regular basis. Are we not? Yeah. We cannot have civil dialogue about anything. We pick sides and then figure out how to defend our side without even thought through. And that doesn't help us educationally. It doesn't help us think. It doesn't help us process. We just defend things. Our culture is swimming in the Kool-Aid of hostility, thinking that we can violate all common decency because of the cause we believe in, although we really haven't thought through the cause. Joseph models living through the midst of injustice and presenting your case when it has an opportunity to present itself. He really models civility. Love versus selfishness. Again, Joseph models living beyond ourselves and looking out for the good of others. That mindset establishes a pattern. And then, of course, thinking in terms of legacy. What, how will I be remembered? What is going to be the mark of my life instead of the immediate gratification? Looking at life through the long-term lenses. That's where we're headed these weeks. <clears throat> Well, I am done. You've done well to hang on. This is a heavy message. And for January 1, you've done well to hang on. I, I, I just want to close by telling you it's a story. And it goes back to the day America told the truth. The story goes like this. A guy, a guy is at an evening party and there's a bunch of employees, there's a bunch of people, and they brought in uh, outsiders. It's a really high ritzy event. And a guy says to a woman uh, uh, at the party, um, hey, after the party, I have a hotel down the street. Uh, and uh, I got $50,000 in my pocket. Would you spend the night with me for $50,000? She blushed and she said, I'd be happy to. He said, well, when we're ready to go, uh, I'll let you know and we'll go. So they're about ready to go. And he says, just as they're leaving, oh, by the way, would you do this for $10,000? And she says, what do you think I am? <laughs> what do you think I am? And he said, we've already established what you are. Now we're just establishing the price. My word to you is, establish what you are. Establish what you are. Because it will not matter that you gave 25 years to the company. What will matter is, your character. What will matter is what you valued and what you, you, the legacy you leave for the next generation. And uh, I cannot emphasize that enough. And don't think I could change them, them, or them. It's not going to happen. All you can work on is you. All I can work on is me. So our Father in heaven, may we be the people who do serious business with our own lives. May we be the ones who trust you, who know you're out for our good, so we can trust you. We don't have to go down other paths. We just trust you. May we be the people, Lord, of character, even when no one is looking, above reproach, without blemish, not just because of what Christ has done for us, but because we live that every day.
even as I pray with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, you, you may be saying, you know what, I need to, I, I need to pray with someone after service. Uh, we'll be up front on the left. We'd be happy to pray with you. There may be one or two things you're going to work on yourself. And you're just telling the Lord right now, God, this is it. And for you, it might be honesty. And for others, it might be patience. And others, it's civility. God, press into our hearts to do what we need to do in our lives. May we do the personal examination to be people who live to please you, we pray. And I thank you that you'll partner with us for your glory and really for our own good too. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. The church says amen. Amen.